Nou goed, die ware misdaadskryver en potgooier Nicole Engelbrecht skyr volgens hom om haar oor haar jongste ware misdaadboek te gesels. Dit is natuurlijk a Samurai Sword Murderer. Dit is die Mornay Harmse story en is baie interessant. Good morning Nicole and welcome. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having me on. Nicole, I have to be honest, this is one of these books that when I started reading it, I couldn't put it down because there were so many things that I went, oh, no, really? Um, and I almost couldn't believe it. It's such an interesting story, this. But I want to start with why you decided to actually write this book. Mm. So I think it was it was a couple of different situations that all came together at once. When Monet Haramsa was released on parole this uh, in, in March this year, I wanted to do an update episode on my on my podcast, you know, just to cover some of the elements that had come up since he had been uh, sent to jail, you know, some of the questions people still had. And at the same time, my now publisher, Melinda Ferguson, was actually wanting to do a book on this, and she discovered my podcast episode on the case, and, and we got together like that. But I think really it's the rabbit holes, you know, it's all those elements, as you said, that people perhaps don't know about and really needed delving into that made this case specifically important to discuss, um, you know, I think so that South Africa as a whole could really understand what happened in this case. Nicole, just to get people on the same page, uh, maybe some of our viewers aren't aware of the situation now, just give us a brief rundown of the parole hearing, what happened there and where where are we now and where is Mornay now? Sure. So um, Mornay was initially uh, eligible for parole in 2019. Um, at that time, I connected with Leonie Pretorius, who is Jacques Pretorius, the victim's aunt, and they attended that parole hearing. At that time, there were several major risk factors and the Department of Correctional Services was not happy to release him at that time. There were then additional parole hearings, up to seven, we believe, in the ensuing years. And in 2022, unfortunately, despite there still being significant risk factors involved, uh, the Department of Correctional Services did release Mornay. Uh, we know he is now back in Krugersdorp with his uh, with his family, and uh, you know that's where he is at the, at the moment. Um, the victim's f family, you know, Jacques Pretorius's family, is still in Krugersdorp, so I know that this this is a difficult time mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And of course, I will acknowledge it is a difficult time for the Haramsa family as well reintegrating Mornay back into their family and into the community. Absolutely. Um, Nicole, I have to ask, I mean, this was really a case that shook the community of Kruger's Dorp when Mornay Haramsa killed Jacques Pretorius that morning with the sword and, and attacked other people at the school and really was, it shook the community, it shook uh, the whole country. But I think what I, when I read the book, there were so many interesting things that came out. But I want to know from you, when you did your research into this book, were there any misconceptions or different things that came to the front that you discovered that, you know, at first glance, when you read the story in the media, you thought, oh, it's definitely like this, or Monet's definitely like this. And when you did your research, you kind of went, oh, wait, there's more to this story. Mm. So I think several things. I think probably the most focused on elements of the story, of the story in the media were the so-called Satanism aspects or the alleged Satanism aspect, and then also the Slipknot connection, the music you listen to. And those were the things that were focused on predominantly. So perhaps those would have been forefront in my mind. But I think I've learned through my true crime journey so far that there's always more to it. And really for me, because I'm usually so victim focused, one of the most important lessons I took from researching the story and that perhaps surprised me was Monet's story and his family's story. Mm. How they really, you know, his family especially lived with a lot of shame because of this case. Mm. And there were many points during my research where I sat back and, you know, I, I really did feel great empathy for the, the child that Monet was at the time, although that, of course, does not excuse his actions. Mm. So I think that was really one of the biggest takeaways for me was just understanding how deeply this also impacts the offender's family. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and Nicole, I think another thing that was really interesting in the book is uh, we obviously speak about his brother quite a lot in the book. Also, the brother was the person that walked with him to school that morning. The brother took the sword after he, he committed the crimes. And also in the book, he explained that at some point he actually approached his brother uh, and explained the whole, you know, what his ideal was, the scenario, what he wanted to achieve. And the brother kind of went, no, I don't want to be involved. And it was also interesting how you speak about the psychology within the brother that maybe, you know, he was too scared to go to his parents. But on the other hand, also, he didn't quite believe that Monet would actually do this. And I think in this whole book, that's kind of someone that stood out for me that I really had a lot of empathy for because I can't imagine what he must have gone through. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm grateful that you say that that's, that sense of, of needing to have empathy for Cornet came across. Because I, I, again, I think it's one of those elements that we don't always think about. We, we quite rightly focus on the victim's family and, and that should always be our first, you know, first port of call when we're feeling empathy. But Cornet also experienced a lot. He really was just a child when this happened himself. And I can't imagine the difficulty that, you know, that he must have experienced after this, realizing that his brother was serious and perhaps if he had said something, it could have been avoided. Oh. Of course, he can't take that guilt on himself. That is not his, you know, he did nothing wrong. Um, he refused to take part in the crime. So, you know, wh whatever guilt he may have carried through the years is not his to carry. But I really wanted to bring that across because I thought I think it's another important part of the story and that so many people actually knew. Mm -hmm. You know, Mornay wasn't keeping this a secret. He was telling people. And I think that's really important for people to, the public to understand as well, is that there are, you know, instances of leakage in cases like this. And if someone is saying something about wanting to commit an act of violence, even if you don't think it's possible or you think it's a joke, take them seriously. You know, that's certainly one of the things I, I took away from this as well. Uh, what also uh, stands out for me is the backstory. Like you mentioned earlier, there's always more to a case than you th read uh, in the media. There's always something extra, which uh, f in a certain way gives you a, a bit more of an insight into the perpetrator's mind, st state of mind at that stage. Um, was there certain things that you discovered later on, apart from, uh, uh, like, for instance, uh, the way the police handled him or the way he... He, he reacted emotionally or not to uh, to the whole court case. Were there little things there that stood out for you? Yeah, so I think certainly what one of the things that stood out for me the most was it almost seemed like Monet had, you know, we know this was premeditated, but there seemed to be a premeditated aspect of him wanting to present in a certain emotional state that he perhaps hoped might mitigate the sentence he was eventually given. Um, you know, Monet walked into this understanding that if he committed this crime, he would go to prison. That was, you know, there was no doubt in his mind about that. But I think one of the most surprising things was reading um, Franco Fisser, the original psychologist who did the assessment on him in Stagfontein, and him coming across and saying, this is one of the most manipulative individuals I've ever dealt with, and oh. Franco Fisser was a very experienced psychologist, and saying that he felt Monet had purposefully behaved in a way that he hoped might people might convince people he was in a psychotic state when he committed this crime. So that was certainly interesting and concerning and um, quite surprising, yes. Wow. Nicole, I think another scene that stood out for me in the book, and it kind of just made me stop and I had to put it down for a bit, is you describe when the police officer had taken Monet to hospital, hospital and they had to do the CT scans, and he decided to ask Monet, you know, if he realized what he had done, and he went, yeah, him, and then he showed him the pictures, and Monet started laughing. And that moment in the book really, really, like, shook me. I had to actually stop um, for a while before I continued reading. Yeah, and that was something that um, the investigating officer, when I spoke with him for the book, Chris Haynes, that was something that really stood out for him as well. And I mean, so many years later, he could describe that scene to me in minute detail and exactly what Monet's tone was 
you know, that was really, really shocking. Mm. And I, it, it sort of made me wonder if this was not also part of Monet's I don't know whether it was an act or whether it was real, and I think only Mornay can answer that question of almost acting as though this didn't really matter to him and this was all just, you know, part of, of what he'd had planned to begin with. Wow. You know, that's as, as I say, we can only make assumptions not being in Mornay's head, but certainly that was very disturbing because it also makes us wonder, you know, we know he wanted to commit mass murder that day and it makes us wonder how much further he would have gone if the situation would have been different. Different, yeah. Uh, one, one obviously always thinks about the victims. Uh, um, Mornay's integration back into the community of Krugersdorp, uh, the fact that it's in the same town as the victim's family, uh, how, how does a family cope with that when you know the perpetrator is coming back, you've lost your son and he's back in your community? What's the, like the things that they are struggling with at this stage? Hmm. I was very grateful to be able to to work with the Pretorius family on this on this book. They were, you know, they were on board from the beginning. Hmm. And I think that this, you know, in a way, we understand that parole is part of our our you know justice system, and it's necessary for offenders to be able to become, you know, beneficial parts of the community again and move on with their lives. But I think for the the families of the of certainly Jacques Pretorius, but also the, the victims that survived, it's very re-traumatizing. Mm. You know, I've had many people who, who, even though I promised them anonymity, did not want to speak to me about this, this case because they still held that fear that they had in 2008. And they were concerned, you know, they expressed to me that they were concerned they were going to stay, start having nightmares again, experiencing insomnia, you know, so I really think that if people have not dealt with this, you know, certainly you can't really deal with the, the death of a, a loved one, mm. but the surviving you know, victims, if they have not dealt with this on a psychological level, this is deeply re-traumatizing for them, especially knowing what was previously a safe space for them, their community for the last 14 years, wow. they could now walk into any store, any church, any, you know, any venue in their town and walk, be facing Monet. Yes. Wow, That's, that really is quite shocking. Um, Nicole, just to get some clarity, um, the Harams family didn't work with you on this book, but the Pretorius family did actually, they were quite open to work with you and speak to you? That's correct, yes. Uh, so I did reach out to the Haramsa family and um, they chose not to respond to my, my inquiries. I fully understand it, though. I think that, you know, this is very difficult for them. They, I'm sure they really are just trying to find the best way to move forward with their lives. And really, I'm hoping that this book will be a point of healing for all the families involved, as well as the, the community of Krugersdorp, you know, yeah. because... I hope that it answers some of the questions people had. I know for the Haramsa family, it brings out things that perhaps they didn't, would have preferred not to have in the public domain. But I hope that they do understand that that will be a point of healing for the victims. And, you know, hopefully that will be a point where everyone can start moving forward. Absolutely. Um, Nicole, thank you so much for telling this story and telling the story in a very humane manner in which you can actually empathise for the whole family and for the community that was rocked by this. Um, and thank you for taking the time to speak to us this morning about this wonderful book. It is The Samurai thank Sword Murdered, The Mornay Adams Story. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for having me. I appreciate this.